Esports Podcast. Noun. A two-hour-long video full of banter and nonsense where the guests are only introduced halfway through and the outro makes you think your internet's died. Huh. Right, this is going to be another episode of Daring Minds, my show with Gio here in Valorant. And we're obviously doing the first one of 2023 now because the last one we did was the one at the end of 2022 when we had Sapphire on. And I mean, I won't even make any jokes because I'll just insert like a blank space here where everyone can write the jokes, can't they? Like, oh my God, two women on the show with Thor and I like, you, you can all figure out your own Mad Libs of whatever you think. Brainwash. Exactly, exactly. Hurry well, the- in the middle of a lawsuit. The joke is, like, I should pretend it's gone the other way. Like, actually, ah, now I, now I think women should be in esports. I mean, even though that was never my other take anyway. I should, I should just play it like that. Maybe that'll work. Don't right? dig so, your grave any more than you already have. It's all good. It is the thing, though. I'm an undead. I'm like a lit, lichkin when it, come, when it comes to fucking female <laughs> esports by that meant analogy. So, right, anyway, for this one, because we're going to do it again. Obviously, now we've got the proper partnership program i will say everyone is ruined for that because everyone does keep saying it's a franchise league right it's not a franchise league and no one bought any franchise spots so, but we all know we're sort of treating like so we're ready for the partnership thing to start and of course one of the teams i mean this was pretty much a shoe in not least because i'll do it very carefully here don't worry their ceo is terrible on twitter just not in the way that gets you cancelled so you see i did that i was very carefully done there and also matthews no problem but obviously fnatic was a show in that they were going to be one of the teams everyone pretty much knew it but actually let's start here mini who obviously is the coach of the team one thing i thought was pretty cool but with i noticed with the, like the timing of when all the moves went in the off season and all the big names dropping like let's be real because it's fucking esports in english language mate even though the european teams are actually like better aside from optic the whole off season was just like the, as an outsider I was like, why am I only hearing about like five NA teams? Like, why does why does no one care about the massive moves in the MENA region? Because to me, dude, the biggest one of the biggest moves of the whole off season was you did just get like one of the best players of all time in Valorant in your team in Chronicle. Like, that's a pretty big move. Like, this guy was in a totally different region team. Like, this is a big deal, right, for your team. That feels like that just dropped at the end of the off season, and no one thought it was that big a deal. I think Europe was a bit late to everything because there was more things going on in Europe at the time. The transfer market wasn't as clear cut. I think in NA, the transfer market was a bit clearer. Like it was a bit of like a, you know, Cold War vibes were in the kind of war room, kind of like trying to okay. make these moves. Like it was like some nights I was up to six in the morning trying to figure out who we're going to get if we can't get this player. Like it oh, like very, it would like, change. Like if this guy goes and we have to get this one and we're yeah, like, ah, so like, you mean, right? It was, it was a brutal like few couple of months, like, you know, because the it, it like it's not just Chronicle. Like Leo, in my opinion, like is maybe a bit more underrated than Chronicle. But Leo is maybe the best in this shit in the world. Like he's that level. Like I think Leo is incredible. Like I'll be honest. Like I've said it before. Like Leo was our number one target in the off season. Oh, okay. Um, and then we were building whoever. Like he could flex into either role we needed. And then we're kind of seeing what would supplement Leo, basically. Right. And basically, the way we saw it was. Mr. Kenenzo had left and they were kind of like the more social kind of elements of the team. And we needed someone who kind of could bring that um, because Leo is a bit of a shy reserve kind of person. So I think Chronicle was that kind of person who could come in and kind of be a bit goofy and kind of there was good relationships with the team already with Chronicle. So, um, yeah, he fit well. Okay, I know you're a massive fan, right, Gio? It's one of your players that you're loving, right? Chronicle. Well, I mean, I just it, so it's been you know it's been a weird thing that's like followed me in esports that I always end up being like a really big fan of CIS teams. <laughs> like you like started in Rainbow Six and yeah, like I mean with Gambit, I always like speak up like Redgar. You know he you know he's always like been amazing. But Chronicle, I think, was always I don't know. He got a lot of credit, but I think like when you talk about people like Redgar or Nats, he would sometimes fly under the radar a little bit as being right. a bit more understated. But I think that when like the announcement was made that he was going to Fnatic, or people were talking about where these players might go, there was never an element of like it's not that people didn't care. Like people were still excited to see where like Chronicle was going to go. So he's been understated, but not to the point that maybe you would attribute to Leo, uh, perhaps. But even then, like in in the last few months that Leo was on Guild, I feel like that's the only player anyone would ever fucking talk about was Leo because he's just an insane sober player. Um, but I'm like super excited about it. I've always kind of liked little like patchwork teams where everyone's from different places. Um, because I feel like when you you have teams where, uh, I mean, for example, it's almost like the opposite of what K Corp have tried to build, where they specifically want a French speaking roster. Like, what a surprise! Um, and 
you kind of get this sort of like homogenous sort of group, which is fine, but I feel like you get different uh, dynamics in those teams compared to ones where everyone's from different areas. So I'm always very intrigued to see like the kind of flexibility you can get from um, having complete like free reign to just take players from wherever. So I think that like the the opportunity to have sort of selected, you know, handpicked those from like different teams in different parts of the uh, the continent and stuff like that is um, pretty exciting. Yeah, I think that's something like in the history of Fnatic that it's like Patrick or uh, um, CGO, uh, Karen, like sure. he's had a lot of um, thoughts about that kind of subject. About the CS team obviously went through like an international change and like his approach for a while was like, you know, there, wouldn't, there hadn't really been like a major winning team that wasn't uh, like a domestic team. They were always, uh, no, wait, that was an international team at the time. Um, so that would be not on his mind a little bit and kind of, you know, he's talked to me and like the team a little bit about like, some of that, but I think in Valorant, it's just kind of clear that you need um, international in Europe. You c it's really difficult to find the players from one region. Like K-Core have a good team, but like they're not one of the teams that you kind of expect to kind of come top two or top three. Um, I feel like K-Core also have like the sort of caveat where their thing was not necessarily French players. It was French speaking players, yeah, which yeah. means that they could get Scream and Navira in there despite not being French. <laughs> you know, the funny thing as well that as well, Midi, is even though I know what Khan means by that, because what he's doing basically, if people don't know, Khan was like a legendary in-game leader, but in CS 1.6, we're talking mainly about like the 2000s. And he is someone who has been in the CGO position, which is sort of like a general manager type overseeing the project, but more from like the player side if you get the angle of it's not just business and stuff and when he's done that in all these different games one of the things that has been quite impressive is in the other games like League of Legends and stuff they've continued to do a great job and so I, I get the sense he does know when to delegate but obviously because Valorant's somewhat similar to CSGO I can see why he would think that because that's what we all thought in CSGO about two years ago and then every year before basically the logic used to go like the best team is always going to be all one country because it's going to be like France or Sweden or Denmark like, just the absolute best players and then if you can it's only normally if you like say you're working with people from regions that have no players that you're going to put together international. The joke is in CSGO, if anything, we're flipping. Like in CSGO, the best team last year was an international team of all big stars. And, stuff, and it had no connecting factor. Everyone was from a different country. Now we even see all the big teams have swapped. Like the joke is, as you said, Fnatic used to be a Swedish team in Counter-Strike. It isn't now. There's like one Swedish player in the team. Then you look at like the other squads. Everyone's changing now. So I actually think the Valorant way, the joke is, we're probably all going to end up like that anyway, mate. Does that mean though in Valorant, like... At this off season, was there ever a world where you would have just kept like? Could you even have just kept the whole for that client of as is? Would that even have made sense? By the way, wouldn't it make more sense? I mean, there were so many players available. Was everyone always going to change rosters, or was there ever a core could have stayed together? I think there was a discussion. We would have definitely have made at least one change. There was discussion about it, but I think that like ultimately we saw ourselves in like the top two position to get the talent. Sure. Kind of yeah. Thing. Um. So it it kind of was like a no brainer, and I think that like the history of our team has been a bit like extremely aggressive is the kind of polite sure. word with um the way we changed the roster. Um, some people thought that was like short termism, I guess, but I guess like me and kind of Colin, our team director, had like kind of a similar vision with like it's an immature game, like it's very new, and like there's going to be some star talent out there, and you you it's going to like. They're going to be out there in this period of time. And so, like, we didn't want to kind of um, be hesitant to change things if we thought that there was just that spark, you know. So our scouting was being pretty good and they kind of celebrated a little bit. And so we kind of built towards a team that for this period, you know what I mean? Like, this is the period now where Fnatic should be, like, popping off. Like, obviously in the past, like, we should have done a bit better. Like, we did very well, but maybe we should have done a little bit better. But... um yeah, so this is the kind of moment, I think, where we kind of um, built the team up and kind of integrated now the players from these fucking, like, super teams, essentially, um, like Leo and Chronicle, basically. So, yeah, I think like, that was the kind of vision at the start, and it's kind of panned out quite well, I think, at this moment. Actually, like, an interesting thing, because, like, saying, like, keeping the core fanatic, to me, as, as a, you know, a third-party observer, like, I've always kind of thought, like, the core of Fnatic is very small compared to what you would call the core of a number of these other really big teams, right? Like, you pretty much say, like, Boaster Durka, pretty much. Like, I think that a lot of that has come from the fact that there have been a number of roster changes, like, and, and iterative processes with Fnatic over the time that they've existed within Valorant. So, 
I feel like you you kind of learn to never be too attached <laughs> to like who makes the core. I mean, I'm sure like, uh, yeah, as time goes on, you said like this is where you start to like really commit and this is where you you should in theory pop off. But I suspect like the next person who's going to start to be seen as part of that core is going to be Alfire because he's been on the roster for a little while now, um, just not as long as the other two. Um, but I feel like that's always made Fnatic this sort of like anything could happen kind of team with regards to who they're going to pick up or whatever, because it's kind of felt like there are those open spots on the team almost like, you know, that, that are, they're not too married to. Is that actually like, a I thing, by the way? Like, I think yeah. that Fnatic like ditches Boaster is when I'll be like, okay, what the fuck is going right. on? But like, but like with some of the other players, it's not even to necessarily say they're bad players or whatever, but it's just more like you can tell that Fnatic are like, willing to adapt and change and, and kind of do whatever in those roles. By the way, is that something, because you said there, like it's sort of something you've you come to as a philosophy, like it's it's like obviously like a very young game. By the way, I even agree with that as a general principle. Like I, if you look at most esports, probably the worst move anyone could do would be watch the first year of the game and then just pay whoever the best player and the best team is like all the money in the world. Because if you see any esport, usually like the first year is so extremely different. So like it's about year three, you hit the stride where, you know, they're consistently all the top players. So in Fnatic, did you also like... The question essentially is, how do you actually message that to players, though? Like, do players know that if they're in the team, they're not necessarily there for two years? Or, like, the, or that... I said, I mean, there's a way you could do it in a positive way. You could sort of be like, we're competing for spots, or we're all trying to be the best. Or something. Like, how, how do you do? How do you handle that aspect? Because there's been a lot of roster moves, like she says, in the team, I think, right? I think, basically, so when we started the team, we were obviously signed as a collective from Summon FC. Like, we did really well in the kind of amateur circuit. And so, like, we were kind of a core. Um, and then we kind of made some radical changes quite early on. Um, kind of Colin kind of was the kind of person kind of pushing for that and I kind of agreed with him that, that those changes need to be made and we were very successful off of those changes and I think that that kind of lingering idea has been there it's not like we directly tell the players like look like if you're not good enough you're going to get kicked kind of thing it's more like like you can kind of see that like if we're able to pick up someone like Durka like five months into the team like I mean you have that, to right that, you, you kind of know what's going on a little yes. bit and so I mean, like, it's not, I, we've done our best to kind of support the team and like, like from a coaching staff point of view, like I, I don't, don't want to sit there and kind of be like, I've given up on this player. Like, sure, we're <laughs> going to find someone else. But at the same time, I'm not stupid. Like scouting does happen in the background. You know what I mean? Um, but I think this is now the point where like a hundred percent I've told like Patrick today and kind of the team today, like I, I'm not a scout anymore. Like I, I can give you some players who are there, but like, this is the team that I need to kind of like. Like, you know, I've got Bro. like four ex extremely good, four extremely good players and an extremely good IGL on my team. Like, I don't need to think about other things anymore. Sure. By the way, what, is it just before we get into like all the future and stuff, give us like some brief thoughts on how last year did go for Fnatic because it felt like, look, you did have those scenarios with like standings and stuff, which made it like no one expected like deep runs, but it felt like every time you were always on the cusp of doing a run and it never really happened. Yeah. So, um, we we had a like debrief today, like with the pro game and like backroom stuff today. And there were like quite a lot of um ups and downs this year, both like on and off the server. And obviously like we're quite good at keeping things private. So there were things going on in the background that kind of was unfortunate and we dealt we dealt with them extremely well, I think. Um and okay. like the fact that it never got leaked or anything is incredible. So that's also how you know as well that you're not an NA team. Like <laughs> we didn't even know there was drama. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Well yeah. Done. It's, not, it's not like drama, but just like uh, like personal issues. And oh, fair like enough. Like okay. Serious things. Yes. So you know, like like quite explicitly, like the Russia situation was obviously something that affected the team. Um. So no doubt. Yeah. I, I'm not using these as excuses. Like we definitely did underperform. But like if you look at our like online performance, we were kind of incredible. Like we lost like three games online essentially. And I think at LAN, we kind of just like, we didn't crumble, but we definitely just underperformed a little bit. Um, I think this game has a lot of like hot streaking. And I think that we just didn't hit the hot streak at LAN. And like some people will be like, you know, chokers, fraud, natic, sure. and all that kind of crap. But like, um, you know, maybe there's some learnings to take away from it. But I don't think it's as simple as just like, you know, we get to a stage and we just choke. Like that just seems irrational to me. So I've kind of to stepped away from this to kind of look at like what are the tangible things I can do to try and improve us and like you know because I can't stop us at like getting to a certain point and just like apparently crumbling I just don't think that that actually is true um but I do I think was... there are discipline issues and things like that and nerves do play a factor so um we're kind of tackling those right now 
I, I was gonna ask is like uh, whether you consider it to be like an online versus land thing or a domestic versus international thing because you could also phrase it as saying like domestically you performed really well in 2022 and then it was international and it's like you didn't even have like or, you know, like in Masters Copenhagen, you were top four. And I know that that's never going to be satisfactory to a team that's trying to win or whatever, but it's still like a notable place to come. So it's you can't really argue that you did poorly internationally, but your international results weren't the same as your domestic results. Is that to you more of like uh, the issues that come with LAN versus online? Or do you think that's something that, you know, for example, moving into this next season, um, you're obviously going to be playing essentially domestically. But you are going to be playing on LAN. Mm. I, I actually, like, I think it was more a LAN online thing. But at the but, same time, there's so few sample sizes of these things that it's like, variance is quite high true. in this game. You've got like, what, like, we lost three best of threes in the year, and those best of threes kind of summed up our year to people. So the variance is quite high. But at the same time, yeah, I do think it was not about domestic, because I, I, got a, I feel like my eye test is pretty good. Like, I can tell when we're playing good or not. And I think in Copenhagen, we came top four. I don't think we played a single good game of Valorant in Copenhagen. I think at Champions, we had played some good Valorant. Like we really, sh we, we started really slow. We were horrible. We showed some extremely good, beautiful Valorant that I know what we can play. And then we just choked against Vision Strikers. Uh, DRX, sorry. DRX, yeah, same um, team, but yeah, yeah, sure. Like we were in a position to just absolutely crush them and then decided to just throw like seven rounds that we shouldn't have thrown basically. So. Yeah, so for me, like Copenhagen was a disaster because I was just like, you know, we come top four, but we play crap. Um, but we we played some beautiful Valorant at Champions, to be quite honest. Like, there was some very bad Valorant, but there was some beautiful. Valorant <laughs> Win some, you lose some. <laughs> By the way, one thing I just want to ask you about because when I was looking at all the rosters for the lock-in tournament, I noticed that actually your team is one of the rare teams. There's not that many, it looks like, that has listed six players. You have six players on your roster, whereas a lot of the teams just have the five. Is there a reason why you took an extra player? So because Chronicle is from Russia and having to... Ah, oh, concerned about like, the visas and stuff, right? We were just concerned about visas. Even like Alfie is from Turkey, there can be some hiffy things there. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. Um, we just thought that we kind of had to bring in a substitute in case. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, I couldn't be the substitute. Like, I love subbing in. Like, I'm not okay. that bad. I love subbing okay. in for Prak. And, like, some of the teams think I'm a demon. So, like, I'm not too bad, but I'm never going to get my shot. So. Oh, you know, the funny thing about that, by the way, mate, is usually, obviously, like, if it's an official game and everyone always, like, flames the person who stands in. The joke is, if you know you're the coach, then you, you have no pressure, like you're saying. Yeah. If you just fuck up the other team's game, it's hilarious at that point. Like, yeah. it's actually you know, more tilting. You never know. It could be a fanatic. Thing. There's a really famous story in Rainbow Six where there was uh, a, a major in rio i want to say it was it was brazil and um the star player of the team got like appendicitis or something like that like okay. 24 hours before they had to fly out and so their coach dizzle who is an incredible guy this the, the fanatic team in rainbow six was australian and so they were obviously all hilarious um uh, he had to stand in and they got to something like top three in the Fucking fucking hell, okay. major with Dizzle standing in for their star player. So was you he never know, maybe. And was he actually good or was he just carried by him? I think he was carried. Like, Fair you know, enough, he, okay. he basically took the okay. like hard support anchor role yeah. and was like, everybody else do right. all this shit. Yes. And like, yes. but whatever. But it's still a fucking story. Oh, it's still a joke. And yeah, you know, course. maybe that's a fanatic thing. Like you go to you go to Brazil, you gotta stand in for one of your players and the coach playing, you you win. So there you go. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean I was hoping that would happen, but no. Like cause I, I do miss like <laughs> like I got a bit of a CS background. I do miss kind of playing and competing a little bit um so every time i do get to sub in a scrim which isn't much anymore because obviously we've got an actual substitute now it did kind of spark that little bit of like and obviously the boys would be like laughing at me and kind of like taking the piss but like i put i would take it as seriously as possible we're gonna be angry sure. at people, you know? oh really you try hard <laughs> yeah it's so bad yeah. Right. whereas they were just like if you get a kill like yeah whatever yeah, oh, yeah, brilliant. yeah. yeah. Like, but right, sometimes right. i was actually good and so it was like guys like if you're like if i'm top frag in this like What's going on, guys? Like, come on. That's what I always feel whenever I'm in a ranked game. Like, I'm always like, if I'm top fragger, there's a problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By the way, as an aside, look, obviously you can't say too much, but I'll just ask the question anyway. We'll see how you answer it, right? We're talking now about, you know, your team being in this position to get whatever players you want and make a move, right? The obvious question I would ask is, was there ever any world, like, was, was he allowed to talk to players, teams? Was, was there ever any world where someone came and tried to get Durka? 
or bolster. I couldn't see either. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if some NA all thought like bolsters look at the shakes of all the antics and stuff. And Durk, obviously, a lot of people respect them. Was, it, was, it, was this on the table in the off-season? Uh, this off-season? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, mm. Mm. <laughs> Someone might have messaged Durk uh, okay. in a way that they shouldn't have messaged Durk. Uh, oh, they messaged right. him directly. Naughty. That's Naughty. a no-no. Yeah, you can't be doing yeah. that, guys. Someone, someone might have done can't that. Can't be doing that. Can't yeah. be doing so, that. Uh, <laughs> That was one. I think there was interest in the past for them both, um, like last year at some point, um, from a big team in NA. But fair enough. Um, didn't really go through, um, obviously. Yeah, but yeah, okay. I don't. It's not really like the game's in a weird spot. Like buying players this, like in the off season, wasn't really that much of a thing. Like, oh, really? Right. Like, no one was really re- willing to buy or sell because there's just so much talent that like was free agents essentially at this point. Like, oh right, was it was the logic like? Oh, actually, that's something I should ask you about. How did that? How was that set up? By the way, was it that like people already knew to like end the contracts around this time? Was it like that? Essentially, all those teams got broken up that didn't get the spots. How how were there so many free agents? Because I was wondering the same thing. There weren't many big like blockbuster buyouts like the other games, right? Um, I'm not maybe not the best person to ask. Fair enough. I, I don't speculate. think that the dates of the contracts, nobody knew, I don't think. So right. it was just like random. But I'm fairly sure the teams that didn't make it to partnership were pretty lenient with the idea. They just released like, people, fair enough. Or at least like yeah. the buyout was so low that it didn't yes. really, you know what I mean? So that I makes a lot of sense, by the way. If, if someone's a casual fan, I know it might sound weird that you'd let like top talent go, but in that scenario, if you if you put a buyout on them, you hold them, you might then unfortunately not sell them because all the other players are free. And then you're, all that will happen from that is you probably don't want to use them anyway because it costs too much. And then you'll just have bad PR because it'll come out in yeah, public that you have. Hated. Yeah, as soon as that comes out, even though, by the way, it might be totally fair tonight, you'll just get hated on by all the fans of that Player. They'll just be like, trapped him. It, like a little bit. There were definitely a lot of players initially that I was interested in that did have buyouts that were quite significant for Europe. Um, wow. But they got re- they got lowered and lowered. Like every week okay. they would just lower them. So it's like, okay, like Fair this enough. is this has gone from like almost two hundred thousand for like this player to like fifty k or something. By the way, um, obviously, like Americans can speak English. I'm told. That's a joke. But, uh, well, the joke is if you don't understand what I meant, maybe that suggests something, guys. So, no, the joke is, right, obviously Americans could play in this team. Was it was the scenario where you only ever going to recruit players that are in Europe for? Was it ever a possibility to get American players? The issue with NA players is, let's be real, like the market in NA is like ridiculous. It's ridiculous, like, yeah. Sure. If I go to NA, my salary is like triple or something stupid. So it's like, right. even like speculating on that was like kind of difficult. Um, there was one player, like Nismo was someone I was kind of looking at. But like mm-hmm. I knew he was like a little bit older and kind of had like a family and a business apparently. So like oh, okay. genuinely like if the guy watches this or whatever, like you're pretty good at Valorant. But um, yeah. Will that the, put you off it, that detail? Because if people don't know, by the way, this, I'll tell you a random anecdote, Gio, that you might like. Because this is just how silly okay. esports is in industry. A few mm-hmm. years back, like just before we all went to the online era, etc. In Australia, their best team was that Renegades team, the one that years ago Monty used to own. But this is a year after that, right? And in this team in Australia that was dominating, their best player was the in-game leader of the team. It was this guy called Dexter. And because he was an in-game leader, Andy was fragging out. Actually, a bunch of European teams were thinking like, oh, maybe we gamble on this guy. And this is not a joke, Gio. For real, when Henry G got control of that cloud nine team and he could pick any player in the world he was actually thinking about this guy but he didn't contact him this is a real story i know henry right because in the bio of dexter's twitter he, as a joke he he had some meme around him that he's like a dad and he has kids but he isn't that's not true but henry saw that in his bio and thought well i wouldn't want to like take him away from his kids in like australia one so he didn't bother no. contact that's true that's actually a real story i know it's is that mad like no, contact him. <laughs> Kids, contact anyway. He could and there was no kids. America. The worst part is there was no kids. It was just a stupid Twitter bio. Oh my god! <laughs> it sounds like the same scenario, Mini. Is it similar? Well, similar like it was more like maybe I, I revealed too much about that, but it's not like we saw. You know, he's he's a dad, therefore can't come. You know, no, no, it's fair just like all the context of everything. You're in NA. He's sure. You know, like he, he's on a great team right now, and he's probably you know he's he's doing well. For yeah, himself, fair enough. So. Um, yeah, he was just one of the people I had on my Excel spreadsheet that was like right. in the corner, like Nismo, like question mark. But like, right. obviously there was so much talent in Europe that we kind of didn't really need to go there, to be honest. I do appreciate, by the way, as an aside, the way that all Americans do with every esports game is just go, oh, everything's so expensive, isn't it? And then they're the ones who at the beginning of every game just pump every salary and buy out to the roof. They do it themselves. Like, the joke is, because I've, I've figured out, American spoiler, here's how the mechanism works. You know how awesome it feels when you rip off your rival for like four times more? He's going to do that to you next time, isn't he? 
fucking you idiot. Like, the joke is, you are actually, by, by definition, in a cartel system. You should essentially agree to not pay over a certain amount. Otherwise, collectively, one day you will all get fucked. Someone, you'll have to pay the two million buyout in three years if you keep pumping the prices up. Because yeah, the joke is, actually... every esports game goes this way. NA is always out of control, mate. Do they have, like, like caps? Like, you know how in traditional American sports you get, like, cap space? So you can't you can't spend over a certain amount on your roster. Well, here's the problem with that, like, Gio. When's that is, come in? is if you remember in Overwatch, they claimed publicly they didn't have a cap, but the whole time yeah, behind the scenes, yeah. there was essentially like like I'm saying, like a soft cap people agreed to. And as far as I know, part of it even was like team agreed. Because as I say, like they all sort of realized, like, wait a minute, all of us, if we just agree not to pay over this amount, then don't we all mm. win in this sort of like like that's one of the reasons why it was even implied actually in Overwatch that like if that went too far, that could have could have potentially got them in league trouble because you know like in california they don't fuck around with like workers well, rights like, and stuff you yeah, know yeah <laughs> i think i i do think though like i know this is a little bit off the topic of valorant but right, i we'll do think that like in uh in just a general sense like one change that definitely needs to happen in like esports business is the transparency and like publication of salaries sure like player salaries sure. like if you look in any sport and that stuff is public knowledge yes um and i think the fact that it's not in esports leads to poor business practice oh, um gosh. really irresponsible spending and also just lack of trust yes. i don't see any way that it benefits anybody Oh, in the um, long run, it doesn't, by the way, because when you keep information secret like that, eventually different people in all areas of the ecosystem get fucked. Like, for example, there'll be scenarios where, like, think about what we were just talking about. I'll tie it back in. What if a team wanted to get a player, but they've heard he's on X amount. They think we can't even go above that, but actually you're wrong. And that was a rumor. He should, that's a player told another player bragging, like when he, like a, valor, like yeah. a team speaks something like, I'm in 20K. And the joke is what you actually would have offered, he would have said yes to, but he's, he doesn't know he's done himself. Because as you say, there's no database. You can't just go and see like in the NBA, like, oh, he three million a year like there's there's no logic to that so half the time the joke is even people in the scene you must be able to talk to this many even in the scene we're all, you're just being the joke is you're like, sort of going off the it, info i'm going off it like a player tells you somewhere another coach tells you like even though we have to just trust those people are telling the truth right well, they might be so shit. because it's like you know for most esports obviously cs not being one but like with the esports mostly being run by publishers sure is the logic that so obviously the responsibility would then most likely be on the publishers to to um publish that information yeah. i'm assuming that part of the incentive for them to not do that is because if the general sentiment or schema is that players are earning blah 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 amount of money and there's all this money in their ecosystem they can sell ab advertising or sponsors better because they look like a sort of sexier prospect if that makes sense is that what do you mean by i would say it's the other way because to me because if it's like if it's like on. oh if all of these like non-endemic like potential sponsors think that there's all of this money in our ecosystem and this is how like you know um like prolific we are or whatever um like then they're gonna more likely want to be involved i'd say that's more like the game dev angle to me the problem is like the team orgs themselves it just directly benefits them for all, everyone not to know all the salaries like like as i'm saying like you wouldn't buy the player for this much if you knew what this was worth and this guy's like, i think essentially that, but like they're helps the ones them who would be making the decision as to whether or not to publish that information like ultimately that's not really on them so i'm wondering what the incentive for the people who would would, who, on oh, who the way. bonus would be. I think for Riot, it would be way better to have all this stuff be public and to know that in League of Legends, like Team Liquid was making, it's like a $7 million salary team last year. Like, that would be amazing if you wanted to, like, publish news articles showing how big the game is. The problem is, I would suspect that in this case, Riot or any game dev, they're largely catering to the teams in their franchise league or partnership system. So if the teams don't want it, they also probably won't do it, if, you, if I had to guess. Because you'd essentially have to force them to do it then, wouldn't you? Whereas now, technically, Geo, any of them could publish it. It's nothing legal about it. In fact, I've believe in some countries it's it, you're not even allowed to make it like a, a rule that someone can't say how much they make i think there might even be like a european union law or something you're allowed to say to your co-workers what you make like so as far as i know any yeah, team could yeah. do it which tie it back in henry g famously did in csgo the problem is one you saw that went for him <laughs> basically got martyred and then secondly also it didn't work out for him in the sense that like it made him look silly when he like overpaid certain people. Whereas I can tell you right now, there are way worse players that were getting overpaid also, but because you don't know it, you don't judge it that way. You just think they don't mind him being bad. Like, but if you knew that the worst player got paid, sadly, 39,000 a month, you can look that up. Like it doesn't look great. Like people are going to endlessly me money, unfortunately. By the way, Mini, what, what, what did you have as a thought on this as a general topic? Anything you want to pick up on? 
Uh, a couple of things, I guess. Like, cool. one thing is like an interesting thing there about like that narrative doesn't really exist in this game. Like, in football, like, we know how much Ronaldo makes or Messi yes. makes or whatever. And it's kind of interesting that like you <laughs> do think about Ronaldo. these, um, <laughs> we do think about these kind of like other regions and like, I don't know, it's almost like it's not a narrative at all at the moment. That's true. But like, it's yeah. kind of funny that I know sometimes which teams should be a lot better than what they are or, or the past few years we've kind of outperformed when salaries were higher or sometimes the lower salary team was really good. And it's like behind the scenes, I'm like so impressed with that. But yes. like obviously publicly facing, no one knows that that yes. little team who actually was paid not as good, like was actually owning it essentially. So yes. um, that's an interesting thing. And I think, I guess um, there is a contract database, I think, but I think it only says like... The it's like the one in league, right? Contract. It just says yeah, yeah. essentially like when your contract ends so that you don't, contact the guy before accidentally right it's sort yeah. of that a poaching stuff in it yeah. the only thing i i think like from a player's point of view is like these younger like tier three tier two players like like it would be nice if they did have some more information about that stuff because obviously yes. i've seen young 17 18 year olds sign yeah. ridiculously stupid things you know yeah. I mean? so the, the more there is to kind of support those kind of younger people who yeah just, when you're not like represented by yeah. an agent at that point or that's also, be. by the way, like that. That's also <laughs> well. All the agents just a bit scummy. You can have that as well. The other. That's the other reason why, in my opinion, it's the org that primarily benefits from it not being published. Because I can tell you, this happens in CS:GO. Sometimes in CS:GO, if you have a team where you did break the bank, you bit like buyouts. You've got like one of the best players, a massive salary. What you do is, if the lineup's not quite complete, and you're like, nah, this isn't going to be the final lineup. You do just sign some player like he's talking about. You get some like 19 year old who's desperate to be in tier one. And what no one knows is the fans think, holy shit, he's in like Vitality or something. You're like some huge team but they don't know he makes like 3k a month and the guy next to him is oops that makes 30k a month like, it's more like football you know like they think it's like the old days where everyone makes the same and you, I, he's a vitality i'm picking vitality just because they're a team with money if people don't not specifically vitality obviously not valorant they're irrelevant but let's rewind it a bit what about this lock-in vitality are gonna do better than you think i think well they will now but they were relevant no, before. i know i mean like genuinely i think they've been slightly underrated i'm just gonna put that all right i think their yeah. coaching staff is extremely good um so, like, I think that maybe there's a player or two that isn't maybe what they need as much, but um, I still think that player's really good. Um, no, it's just an example. Their coaching, their coaching staff. Like, I, no, it's just a, a, a narrative I heard quite a few times. Oh, right. Is it actually a thing people say? Fair yeah, people okay. are kind of down on that team. Ah, I, right. I think that um, I have a huge respect for their head coach. He's like, Kutsala, he's like a really young coach, like 23 or something. And I think he's like, kind of an, like, if I was a scout for coaches, like, he'd probably be on my list, you know what I mean? So. Oh, okay. Shout out to Vitality. <laughs> By the way, since obviously everyone's looking forward to the VCT lock-in, this one in Sao Paulo, I actually want to get your take on that because I know from League of Legends, they actually had this a few years ago. They've got rid of it now. They had a lock-in tournament, but the premise used to be that like it was supposed to be an exhibition tournament. Like it actually, as far as I know, it didn't count towards the rest of the circuit. Like it didn't help you do anything in the splits and it didn't get you any points for Worlds. None of that jazz. As far as I know, it was meant to be an exhibition tournament. And the whole point was, because League of Legends is mostly leagues, they just wanted to have another tournament, you know, and have like a thing where it'd be fun. And not. But the problem it always had was, because it was put at the beginning of the year before the first split begins and after the off season, which is only a couple of months in league, I, I'm not joking. I think they ran it for two years or something. Every single time, the majority of the teams didn't have their real rosters. And so unfortunately, it never really lived. Like it was supposed to be almost like 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 a kickoff tournament that was supposed to be, it felt like, you know, like, I mean, it's, like even the, it's even called the bloody lock-in. The idea is like you lock in your roster, play the tournament, and everyone's like, wow, this split's going to be great because that, but it never worked. So basically, I want to know for Valorant, do you actually get the sense? I mean, the rosters look good. Is this going to be like a real tournament, do you think? Is it going to be like a, is it going to, is it going to be like a VCT essentially? Those lands we had last year. If we win, then it's a hundred percent. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think that um, the way that we kind of were approaching this, we knew this tournament was happening, and we just thought it was going to be like hundred percent, like double limb bracket, like group stage, all that kind of stuff. And right. obviously, the format has kind of mm, not gone that way. It's obviously gone to a a bit of like a you know less competitively. I mean, it's one and done, isn't it? Single limb. It's a massive it's, single yeah. We get to play Sentinel's first game and one of us is going home, which is kind of brutal. Um, That's nuts. You know, so... At least it's not that like... far from Sao Paulo to America. So, <laughs> so. A bit further for us, but hopefully, you know. Um, so, yes, yeah, I'm probably the worst person to ask because we got like, right. that artist team first. But at the sure. same time, I kind of appreciate the fact that, you know, our team's one of those teams that understands that, like, this ain't all about 
how many headshots you can hit. There are other things going on. Like there are there are fans. There's people watching for certain reasons. And I didn't watch the video of the guy who explained why it wasn't a bad format, but I would imagine there's some very good reason as to why. Like it was uh, my, way. my primary assumption is that like I mean this this tournament as it stands is going to last about a month. And uh, if you've got 32 teams and you're going to do a double elimination um, tournament, that's going to last about two and a half months. So that would be my assumption. I mean, I actually think what is perhaps a more egregious part of the format is the fact that the second group gets to watch the first group play for like two weeks and then they get to play. Is that the other way around, though? Like, would, like whichever would group it is. Would be the other way around? Like... The first teams that play get to sit there and watch the second teams play and prepare. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Oh, okay. Like they, okay, they, okay. They, yeah, they get like two weeks to prep and yeah, watch yeah. how everyone else is playing. And it's like, it feels like you could like maybe alternate days or something. So kind of, I think the 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 two weeks and then two weeks well, the, is... The reason is because we fly later. So they've saved money on mm. us flying later on. I mean, Classic yeah, like saving money is going to be a lot of white single elimination. I think, I think, I think basically the, the issue is is that it seems like they don't want to have any games on a mul- on, on different streams or off streams. They don't want multiple streams. It, it, so. Oh, yeah. Is, Which, you know. yeah. It's just the right approach. Like, if you don't know Geo, that's why in, Le- in League of Legends, Worlds has one of the most basic formats ever, but it lasts like a month or a month and a half. And you're like, what the? The CSGO mid is like two and a half weeks or something. Like that. That's why it's because Riot doesn't want to do yeah. like dual streams for some reason. They don't want like a B stream. They want it. They essentially, as far as I can tell, in all their esports, because how they made LCS remember like they want you to sit there at the beginning of the broadcast and just stay and watch every team and every game that come in. even though to me I will say I think that's mad because that's not the way anyone consumes sports like I don't sit down like I'm a huge fan of Premier League mm, oh it's gonna be sucks having to watch these four games of Everton and fucking till I can get to the Liverpool I just tune in for the fucking Liverpool game don't I and then I tune off and then just watch the score on fucking I would say teletext but that would be the maddest boomer reference <laughs> so not teletext the internet I watch the score on the internet like no kid even knows what teletext is it that's, that might be one of my worst. That might actually oh be my, my worst. Oh my god! I forgot teletext shit. even fucking existed. <laughs> <laughs> I just really, really watching the game. Squad mini. I guess to me, like the biggest argument then comes down to like, does multi streams actually affect the product? And like, I don't know the answer. I don't know either. Like, yeah. I when I watch CS:GO, like I've never had a problem. When I've watched Worlds, I've never had a problem. Like, so from the viewer perspective, I don't know. Like, no, no. I don't know. Like, I guess it's down to like the more casual kind yes. of viewer. Like, what does what what actually excites them or entertains them, or how can they keep up? Like, I don't know. I mean, my parents do watch some of our games, so I'll ask them. Like, how, oh, how did the experience okay. go? Like, okay. Um, but no, By the way, in a survey. <laughs> do they? I have to ask this if you say your parents sure. watch. Do they ever actually? Because remember, parents even when they sort of think they know, they still think it's like, oh, they're just good at games. Do they ever like naively turn to you and go, like, why? Are you played in this team do they ever say any mad shit like that like i just think you're better than you are or something <laughs> no i think that like they kind of understand because obviously i was like i was never pro but like back in my day i was like you know a top uk player for team. oh did they understand what the esports was at the time like they i they knew i was going to tournament like i they had to kind of sign off on the idea of me going to tournaments oh, fair enough. like i was yeah. 15 16 they're like why are you leaving the house and going across the country to play All right. video game? like so once I won some money, they were like, oh, this is a thing. So they kind of understood from then. And I always hear something. that from people that like the, the point at which their parents got it was when they made money. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. That's, which is not my experience. And obviously, I'm not a player, but like I, I always find that funny how that seems to be such a common thread. I'll tell you I'll something really like, dark. Here's a really dark anecdote. So I won't put any names in, but I'll just tell you the premise. In Korean okay. StarCraft, which is one of obviously the first big, like, massive esports yeah. games in the world. And if you don't know, even in the 2000s, I don't know how true it is, but they used to claim publicly that there were players making, like, $800,000 like, a year salary. Like, outrageous numbers, like, or 300000 which back then was mental for the 2000s, right? In this era, the same thing would happen, Gio. You'd have all these players where, especially because of how, like, hyper fixated on uh like school success and job success careers at the time it went like this until you made it as a pro and you were making money yeah obviously you were sort of like you either didn't tell your parents or they they didn't like it right and but here's where it gets dark but when you won and you become the champion they would accept you but this is this is so dark but i heard there were actually some top players where because they were like 17 or whatever their parents had like the financial control over their winnings so half the reason why some of the parents accepted it is they just took the money exactly there was a guy i won't say who but there was a guy who won a lot of massive tournaments and by the way it's really hard to be good at starcraft that is the game where they just practice like 60 now and then his dad again i haven't said who it is his dad was 
just spending that money on the side, like new car. And then it, the worst thing is, I, this is what broke my heart. It's when I read it in an interview, the player was like, no, no, but it's good though. I still get like pocket money. It's like, yeah, brother, that's all your money. That's what? all your money. You get pocket what? money? Just like one. <laughs> what, what pocket money? <laughs> that's because he wasn't allowed like, publicly to say anything. It was dad. Probably. You know? Probably. Exactly. Punishing. Exactly. I'm just saying That's it. Horrible. That is rough in it. I know. Luckily, so not in that fucked. one. Holy shit. By the way, I, I have one thing I actually did want to bring up. This is the one thing I sort of made a mental note of, Gio, because I want to see if, mm. if you guys have a different take from me. So I was watching. I wasn't really. I'll just say it. I saw the, saw the result. I saw the result of the eSports Awards. And very interesting because mm. did you see Team of the Year was loud from Valorant? And I remember yeah. the first thing I thought was, look, I get it in the sense that if you don't know, I was even on those panels in the past. If you win like TI in Dota, I've heard the panel members, they even tell you like, you'll be a contender for that category, no matter even if you did nothing the rest of the year. Same in League of Legends. If you win the League of Legends World Championship, you don't even have to win a split or a, just win that and they'll put you in the category because them, it's such a massive tournament, right? Is the reason why Loud was the winner of Team of the Year just because they won champions? Because here's what I don't get. Logically, didn't Optic actually have a better set of performances over the whole VC? In Valorant, they were better. Like, they were, what, second, I third, think, and first? I mean, Loud had, what, so, a second and a first? Like, that's it? It's obviously so hard to, to judge because, like, what actually, you know, there probably aren't, like, strict. You, there I mean, aren't. You just, you said just you're on the panel, decide right? it, exactly, yes. But it's like, yeah, while well, Optic had, like, you know, really good results, the, the story of Loud is obviously not only did they kind of, like, they come from essentially a lesser region, they've won, like, the sure. World Championships, but a lot of the story throughout the year was that they were rivaling with Optic. So they were in this, like, um, uh, fucking what's the word i'm looking for grand finals with optic like yeah, yeah. earlier on in the year and they lost to them and then they've like come back so i think i would assume that the story like adds on to that that fact would you have picked them that. for a team of the year were, were they your best volunteer i i voted for them oh the team enough. of the year okay. but also like i'm biased to vote for what's happening in valorant anyway um, well i just went out of valorant because obviously you're a massive optic fan you could have picked up against oh. them if you thought right yeah, I think that I actually think that my top two teams of the year in Valorant would have been Loud and FPX. Over up, they came first, second, and third. The lands. Yeah, like, I why, would have. Why picked... have you changed course on them all of a sudden? What? I, no, no, no. I love, I love as a team. I love Optic, but the reason I would have picked FPX is also because I really loved the story of. of oh, FPX. so we're not going off it's pure like, accomplishments here, right? No, okay, no. I enough. and yeah, again, like I don't know if like if that is or isn't no, no, okay. A good you. way, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of like the best way of judging the team of the year is the team of the year supposed to be the most accomplished? In which case, yeah, probably Optic. Uh, but in terms of team of the year like like everything that that team has done in that year like for me i think that the story of what fpx did and what happened with them and the fact that they had this huge setback and they came back blah 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 blah, blah sure. like that i think was you know that's like a netflix show team right oh, yes, and like course, for yes. me that that feels when you're you're voting for like team of the year or like player of the year or whatever like it's shit like that that like gets me going um so that's kind of how I look at that, but Fair I can enough. see the, you know, the argument. I just wondered, it. what do you think, Minnie? What if, like, and this one, first of all, how would you, how would you decide your team of the year? Do you take narratives in? Is it just how good you are at the game? What would you, who would you have had as your team of the I year? I think that's a difficult one because obviously these awards are a little bit like, you know, they're iffy to begin with. They too, are. Actually, they are. So. By the way, it's spoiler, yeah. they, they are in the sense that like, it's not even the fault of the people who vote. It's actually who decides. Because if you don't know, the way the awards work for real, like we're saying, it's, it's not like it was the Valorant team of the year. It's all games. So what happens is, like the joke is, like Gio said, she could be, say Gio's on the panel, then what happens is she sits there and then when someone goes team of the year, like maybe for Valorant, they ask her because she's an expert. But the joke is, if it was like CSGO, a game she doesn't watch, then me or Richard Lewis has to go like, right Gio, this is why I think this team should or shouldn't be. And the joke it's, mm. it's like a court of law. It's just if the lawyer just does an awesome speech. Like if, if Richard Lewis does an amazing speech, maybe Gio chooses to pick like FaZe Clan from CSGO instead, even though she didn't watch the game. So in that scenario, is it Gio's fault she voted for a game she didn't watch? That's actually her position on the panel. So don't worry, by the way. You don't have to worry about going like, I disagree with their votes. Like the joke is half the panel would disagree. It's a very, it's a very, it's kind of a weird setup. So what, what, what would your take be individually? If this was the mini team of the year for 2022, who would it be? Louder. Uh... Fine. In Valorant. Fine, yeah, yeah. Fine, probably. I don't know outside of... I think there was probably teams outside of Valorant. Probably. No, basically, I just wondered, like, specifically in Valorant, because I just thought, did no one else think the same thing? So essentially... 
Optic just had to win champions. Well, Optic won of the nominees. I'm trying to remember. It must have been, It was a while ago that I even, like, Optic Optic and Loud. Like, they're the one and two. I think they were the two as far as I know. performance base. Like, they're the one and two. Like, uh, the, the tournament that Loud crashed out of was a tournament where they played Crew who notoriously would always beat them. And then That's they their rival, Optic. right? Sure. They played Optic in the group stage. So it's like, you know, a tough luck kind of vibe. Um, but yeah, I think the story, like, I'll give you this one for free. Like, Sassy was potentially joining us last year. Like, I okay. had a call with Sassy okay. at the start of 2022. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We had a place, uh, we had a, a server role we needed. Uh, Sassy was a free agent somehow. And hmm. basically, we had a call with him. The call went really well. Like, he was definitely considering it. But he basically was like, you know, I got a life here, I got family here. Um, and I'm going to try and win a championship from Brazil. And I was almost like, Okay, good luck with that kind of vibe. Um, well, the good news is he's definitely changed his mind on that mini. <laughs> and now yeah. you get to play him in your first and, game of the new and, season. Oh, and then yes. he, go, he goes ahead and wins a championship, and then he plays me in the first game. Yeah, but no, like, so I'm kind of just I kind of proud of him to a degree. Like him in um, Sadhak really kind of just like out of nowhere made this team really good. Like I heard the coach is pretty good too. I don't know him too well, but so I got kind of a, a respect for them. Um, Optic were always going to do well with the way that they kind of structured their team and the kind of the experiences they've got. Um, I think the FPX thing, like I agree, like completely, like, um, like I said, we have some problems this year. Like FPX clearly oh, had some wild, problems. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 I kind of super impressed. Like um, the way Angel and the coach dealt, dealt with that must have been incredible. Like all I'll say is they were the team where when I would ask some of my CSGO players turned Valorant friends, like before the VCTs, like who should do it? They always said like FPX, like in the practice is easily the best European team. That's what they told me. Uh, well, like I mean, online, might, be, we might were, be full of shit. Might be full of shit. I don't know, but that's what they were telling me. No, no, me. no. We, we don't heights for our way. We don't practice them very much. Oh, I don't enough. know. I don't know. Like practice wise, like how good they were. Obviously, on online, we were kind of like a little bit on top at times. So, like, we got to land and kind of lost to them. It was a bit disappointing. But, um, no, clearly, like, they're just a really good team. Like, if they can go, like, with a substitute for an event, for half the event, be with a sub, wild, and then yeah. their actual player comes in and they win an event, like, that's kind of incredible. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, yes. we saw how shit we were with two subs. So, like, you know, like, yeah. the respect. By the way, since you mentioned those players who obviously from Loud now are on the Sentinels team because they made that weird team where they took like players from fucking like version one and like whatever, they made that weird like Frankenstein team. What do you think of the new Sentinels roster? Is it good? Uh, I... if, we, if we beat them, it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I, see how the, I see how the dynamics work on all these. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think I said publicly like the question mark was on tens a little bit because um, obviously he's like super hyped player. Sure. Um, in the past, only could really play jet and reina to like the super high level um we hadn't really seen his raise too much so and obviously that team had a lot of baggage with it the, the previous sentinels team like obviously super skilled but kind of like over time just dipped as the game kind of sure. matured. um so there was a bit of a question mark on tens but you know after watching some of those off-season things like he's clearly got the mechanics still like he, with the coaching staff they got like he's going to be good so I think it just is one of those weird things where it does it gel or not. Like you can't tell with these kind of very mismatched teams. Like we're kind of, we got a core on our team, so like you, you kind of expect us to do quite well. But their team's like crazy. Like it's a weird mix. So it's either going to do really well or it's not. Is the kind of vibe I, I imagine. I think you know. I have a lot of faith in Psycho as a coach, um, and that's. I mean, I think the players on the team, I, I would probably agree with you where, like, for me, the question mark was tens because uh, just obviously didn't really know where he stood. But I think so much of the problem is that tens was kind of set up for failure, like literally in game uh, in, in a lot of what Sentinels were doing over the last year. Like he didn't really receive the adequate support that he needed to be like enabled, um, <clears throat> which, you know, I think... Um, a certain amount of that blame falls on Shazam. Um, and so uh, having a new environment for him um, in terms of like what the actual structure of the team is, I think could be huge. And I agree with you, like, even though, you know, they didn't get to the finals of the, <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to say this, but like the, the Ludwig event thing. Um, I think like seeing some of the ways that tens like played as an individual 
in that tournament was really impressive and and you kind of can't really say like oh he's washed he's not like as, oh, a, right. as a mechanical player um but yeah the thing that i'm the most excited for and get the most kind of burst of faith about this roster is the coaching stuff more than anything because the biggest issue that i had with sentinels before was just like the shameful lack of structure where it was so obvious from the outside that that was the problem and yet they they would not fix it um it, it made me want to bash my head into a wall do you have any thoughts <laughs> many on sentinels last year <laughs> I remember because they were our main competitor in the first land we went to. Yeah, I had three feeling, million years ago. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had a feeling that they were like the better kind of individual team. Um, and I remember thinking like the way that we were kind of structuring our day, like you kind of could see them at random points of the day and you kind of know like what the practice schedule might have been. Um, Is the implication it, like, it was a bit, it wasn't very heavy? I, I don't know. Like, I don't want to like speculate too much, but like, I remember being like thinking like we're getting up really early and kind of doing the kind of like we're we're ridiculous. Like we're, we're grinding. Sometimes it's too much. Like so we're ridiculous. So I remember saying to the boys, if we can't keep up this grind, the, the way we're doing it, like we we can we'll beat this team. Like you know, it might not be this tournament or whatever, but this will be like you know. And I mean, it did it, it, it kind of show that they kind of dipped a little bit. But again, like they're all nice people, so it's like I, I don't want to sure. piss them off too much. Like, yeah. I By the way, the that answer, drama man. though, that was delicious. That Shazam that drama Shazam on Twitter. Because <laughs> here's what's amazing about that. That so this so rarely ever happens if you don't know if you're a casual fan. Look, the idea of like, you know, like I was supposed to do this. Well, he said this was shit. That now happens, of course. But the idea Shazam actually opened the nuclear silo and fired that nuke where he was just like, look, you basically just told me, let this Shroud guy play. Do me this favor and you're in the team. Like, like oh! Fucking hell, dude! Did no one else key on that? Is some of the greatest drama like, you'll ever see. I seen. love what's his face. Rob is that the name of the guy who runs the team? Yes. Who like when he came back and he was like, "Oh well, you know, like if you've actually finally decided you want to play, then I wish G two the best of luck." But you like could have done that while you were still on our team. The only problem with that though is though that doesn't totally work because it's like, bro, you're actually implying you knew the whole time everything we've all said on these shows. Like it's a team of massive mm. superstars and egos who get paid a million billion and they think they could just play like free for all. Like the joke kids you made it sound right like that's the only part it isn't i agree geo in the individual battle against shazam that was like a battleship strike but it actually also made let look stupid you know what i mean like yeah, yeah. it wasn't a great pr win for the org i'll give you that it's like i know imi who's the coach at g2 and like he he was kind of i love imi up shazam recently so you know if this youtube I mean, does well like you know it could always be one of those things where like it always looked from the outside that like at least in the last year um shazam was not the right fit for sentinels like whether it was shazam's fault or it was the org's fault whoever's fault it was like it looked like something was not right there um that doesn't necessarily mean that person is a bad player or they can't succeed elsewhere and so you know like at the end of the day even if shazam did fall into having like a poor work ethic or he you know <coughs> just didn't like fit in the environment that well anymore does not uh, automatically mean that he's not going to do well on G2 and you know I'm kind of with you I trust Immy's judgment so if, if Immy has faith in Jazam then you know maybe he has found a, a place that's given him sort of a new lease of life I'll also, yeah. by the way, just like with Ardis when he was in FPX, I will never stop just smiling at the thought. Because I remember when Imi actually in CSGO went to America and became a coach. The idea a guy with the most brutal Scouse accent is talking oh, like Americans. I love it. I, I love it, know. mate. I, I love everything about it. I don't know what he's know. talking about. Because remember, all Americans think you're going to roll in like Harry Potter. Like, oh, actually, I'll put like, and then they must just meet that guy like, what? Because I, even I get this, and I don't have even vaguely close to a scout. I even get that one geo where everyone in other countries is like, so where in Scotland are you from? And I'm like, whatever. Bro, <laughs> fuck off! Like, yeah, whatever. So I can't a even imagine people, what it's like. You know, them. I get a lot of people in my stream ask me where I'm from because they can't tell what my accent is. Okay, which I find so fucking very strange. I mean, to be honest, but, with the artist, like, he didn't have to even travel to NA. Like, I'll be honest. Like, I think if Alfie and my team from Turkey, he he wouldn't have a clue what artists was saying. No, happens. like some of us in the England can barely Artis understand. Has really exactly, exactly, accent, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
Oh. Like, what about I, um, <laughs> what yeah, team I did want to ask? Like, if Tenz is motivated and he's got the coach staff around him, he's going to pop. Like, let's be real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, look, he's obviously mechanically skilled as fuck. Yeah, right. Here's one question, team. I do want to ask you two about, which is, sure. you remember when we did that episode with George Geo, which was mm-hmm. where he was teasing, like, because that was the big news, wasn't it? Like, you won't believe the Super Team Cloud Nine is bit spoiler. Oh. Like, that's been yeah. completed. Like. Here's the question. Does it live up to the bill in? Some pretty good names. Like, if you're making an... Here's the thing. If you're making an NA only, I'll add that caveat. If it's an NA only super team, it's pretty, some pretty good names here. The problem I, I have was when they said, like, super team, I was... That's why I was like, oh, so you must be getting, like, Nats and, like, all the... Super team? This must be amazing. It's like, these are pretty good names. What do you think? I I really, really like the Cloud9 roster. Um, My one, like, question mark doesn't come from any specific person on the roster, but more how the grand final of the Rebel home ground went. Um, I expected them to do better against 100. I actually predicted them to win, oh, but okay. I expected them to do better against 100 Thieves. And like that, that one grand final at that one event is not the be all end all for this team. And obviously that event was at the start of December. So they hadn't been together for a very long time. They haven't been scrimming for a very long time or practicing or whatever. Um, but as far as the people in this team, Cloud9 are probably the team I'm the most excited about uh, oh, just okay. because of who is on the team. Sure. And I love MCE. I think, I mean, we've, we've had him sure. on before. Old um, coach of the guard, if people don't know. Yeah, I think he's like, he's a really good coach. I love like his attitude. Um, and the thing that excites me the most about Cloud9 is there's so much flexibility on it. Um, because I think especially when they brought Zelsus in, as like their fifth player like it, it's just sort of like a, okay he can basically do anything um you have both a leaf and yay like when they first announced that i actually thought one of them was going to end up being like the sixth player because i didn't know who was going to like take the role because obviously we knew chamber was going to like go to shit so it's not like there'd be chamber and a duelist like um but the way they've kind of like situated each other around those roles i think there's so much like flexibility and skill in the team that i think their skill ceiling is probably really high, um, but I'm interested to see like in uh, February, like how they compare to how they were in the beginning of December. And who who are Cloud9 even fucking playing? Um, they are gonna play, oh, Paper X. Paper X, the same roster as before? Oh yeah, basically, yeah. That's a tough um, game, that's not an easy. That will be, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's not an easy one. But I think, yeah, I, they're a team that I'm gonna like be looking at um, quite strongly because I have a lot of faith in their roster. Okay. What do you think, Manny? I I was super excited for the team. Like, I thought that, like, Zelsus was, like, a really underrated... Like, everyone knew he was good, but I thought he was almost, like, maybe best in slot at the, like, Flash initiator. They call it Flex in NA. I don't call it Flex, but... Yeah. Basically, their jet players in NA don't really play Raze that much, so they kind of mess it around a bit. But I thought he was... Um, like really like if i was gonna hand pick a team like he probably makes it on my team oh, like, okay. he's super good. If you're picking any players yeah i think so yeah um and then you got yay right like yeah, like that speaks for itself like vanity Slam dunk, top, right yeah top top two top three igo like it just all just it it does seem super ish um it just comes down to because valorant has like so many role conflicts and stuff like it comes down to the roles make sense like you're right. saying about leaf and yay like Leaf has always really been the jewelist of the team. Like Yay has always been the jewelist of a team. Like what what happens there? But like Zappa's super good in a shitter. Like Zelus is super good in a shitter. So they've got the support there. Um, it just how does that kind of does Leaf go to Killjoy? Like or does Leaf go to an issue? I don't I don't know how it works. So I think that's it was, the big question mark. Oh no, I could be wrong. What happened at home ground? They were all playing chamber, right? So we didn't get to see like. I mean, and and I'll, I'll add something as well. Like many teams didn't foresee the chamber. In their <laughs> By the way, the game, that is one thing you have to did. say about Riot Games. If you come, obviously, you come from CS:GO, mate. In CS:GO, we obviously get updates like every two years, and even oh, yeah, then, like yeah, they're not the end of the world. You know, it's like, a, dude, Riot even in Valorant seems to have the same strategy. When they nerf, dude, they just kill. They just kill the character. Like they don't because I always say they never nerf incrementally. Like just to see what, what happens if we take the teleport down a tiny bit. They're always just like. It's either the most OP shit ever or it's like nerfed to the ground. Like, what do you think of that aspect? Because the joke was like that that character dominated play for the last like six months, right? I think I think to be honest, I think a lot of the changes they made over the, the course have been 
they have been incremental, but then when there's something that's so like everyone hates, they'll just go, okay, we'll just cut it. Like right. it happened with Jet and right. it happened with Chamber, but realistically behind the scenes, like Sage has gone through loads of weird like things. That's true. Yeah. Sky's been through loads of weird things, like adding one orb to like an alt. So it's eight orbs now, like those little things, like people, it's not sexy. So people don't really care. But as soon Fair as like off. something like just is hard cut, like I agree, like it's kind of like, it's kind of interesting that like we had to essentially plan our off season around the idea that they might hard gut an agent or not. And like, how does that work? Like, how do you, you do know? that though? Like, what, like it had to actually change up which dynamic of team you would have made. It wouldn't have changed us luckily. Cause ah, we right. got, um, like Dirk is technically really the duelist on the team, but he was just playing chamber for some fun last year. Like he wanted to play chamber. So fair enough. Um, that's why in our off season, we were kind of testing alpha year on chamber, which was originally the ah, attention. Okay. Um, because I was like, if it doesn't get hard nerfed, it gets like middle nerfed. I think I prefer Durka on the duelist because I think that Durka is more of the duelist role. Um, it's just that he snipes, so like, well, he's the upper operator, you know. So that was something. That's the part I always. That's the part I've always found really fascinating actually about Valorant when I try to explain it to other people who are either from CS or it, is that it co it genuinely does combine the mobile element with the FPS element. Like that's one thing a lot of people who are CS Go fans don't know. You know, they understand the idea it's different roles and that they don't know that. Like for example, the AWPA can be in different roles as well, and that completely changes the dynamic of the team. Obviously, they still think it's like CS well because remember the joke in CS AWPA is a role, whereas it's just like a gun you mm. use on the agent in this case, right? Well, that's the way most teams have structured it, right? Like most teams have given the Upa the role. So when there's yes. a duelist as the Upa, he he played duelist. And when it became the chamber that's the Upa, he becomes a chamber. Like initially, I thought that was the wrong way to do it, to be quite honest. Right. Like, I thought that like Durka should just be duelist no matter what. And like, yeah, Fia can come in and play chamber because he's fucking sick of just fragging. So most teams just went with their sniper would be the sniper. Right. Um, so they did have that CS approach. Ah, um, I see. So, but yeah, like when we were switching stuff around, people were like thinking we're crazy. But I, I genuinely think there was there was merit to teaching someone else to snipe on the team. I think did have genuine merit, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Um. I was just gonna like jump in and say, just given that you asked, like you're you're right, they were still playing chamber at home ground. I don't know why I thought that he was already gone by that point. Um. That it was his last hurrah, I suppose. Um, that must be why everyone was playing him. So, then, so like last chance. Yeah, <laughs> Leaf. Leaf was playing a lot of Viper. Um, okay. Yeah, he's played Viper in the past. He played a lot of Rays as well, um, okay. which is so interesting because it's like so. For example, on Fracture, because um, I feel like Rays, I would always assume Zeppa's going to be playing Rays. But on Fracture, they would have Zeppa on Fade and then Zelsis on Breach, so they would run a double initiator. And then put Leaf on like the I suppose secondary duelist role, even though Ye is on Chamber, but like Chamber replacing the primary duelist. I, you know, I think um, I think the roles yeah. in that team should always have been Leaf plays duelist no matter what. They always would do the kind of flex NA thing. Where I think hmm. like Leaf is such an incredible Jet that like. Sorry, I mean if if Jet wasn't on the server. Ah right. Like, oh. You know I mean? gotcha, if Jet wasn't gotcha. required for the map, they would always go Zappa raise and then. Um, right. Get, oh yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty picky with the but way that's I such do. A, that's such that's a thing awesome. in NA. It's like, it's like your initiate. Well, because when, yeah, when, like, Chamber came in, it was like you would combine, the initiator would also play, or, like, initiator and secondary duelist became, like, one role. I suppose that's what they call the flex role, right? Um, so it's like the raise <laughs> player was usually, like, a KO player as well. Yeah, yeah. Which I think that was happening, though, even before that. Because I think genuinely, like... Yeah. Jerka is so good because he's one of the few duelists in the world that plays chat and raise. Like, well, used to. Now, yeah. far more people do. But in NA, it became like, it wasn't really a thing for a very long time that they would play both those agents. So, I think yeah, yeah. They that, would be on different them. different players. Yeah. yeah. As I, it's funny because as somebody who's watched a lot more NA Valorant than EU Valorant, and I even say this as somebody who obviously used to cast VCT EMEA, um, but like that's the idea like the jet and the rays is played by the same person like feels a little bit weird <laughs> by the way i'll tell you one team as an outsider that i'm interested in obviously mainly from a narrative angle here but also because if people don't know i not only knew some of these players in csgo but especially in overwatch dude i think that t1 team could be really fucking spicy because people are going to think because mm. of drx like oh like koreans can be like Call good me. but they won't be the best it's like you don't know some of these players like as you say oh. there like the sire player guy i've already told you the past is mechanically really good 
Overwatch. The Carpe guy was absolutely one of the best players in all of Overwatch. He was a fucking monster. And then they got Zeta, who was the best CSGO player in Valorant and was obviously good on Cloud9. I actually think for real, this lineup, like the raw talent, gaming talent, it'll, it'll have to remain to see if it works in the server, but the raw gaming, like anyone who thinks that because this isn't League of Legends, like, oh, Koreans won't be the best. Like, this team could be. I feel like on paper, there's some real talent here. Steel died for this roster. He sort of did. Be worth he it. sort of did, true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think this is going to be a like. I just I'm so stoked to see Carpe. Like, he's going to be so good. Especially because like the Koreans, so you assume they're going to grind. They're just going to fucking be, be grinding the whole off. What do you think, Mini? Yeah. Is there, obviously this isn't your region, but do you have any thoughts? I'll be honest. It's the region I know the least about. Um, but if they got the, I think the the thing that makes DRX so good is they've got three backroom staff that have been right. there for two years or th almost three years. Um, and they're all kind of got that kind of Counter Strike kind of background. Right. They're all a bit older. Yes. Um, they were all ex pros. Like they 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 understand everything about it. And the kind of team they've been able to build over time because they essentially had the monopoly on the league. Like they're the team that if if any player wants to join that team, they're going to get them because you know why would you not want to join the best team? Yes. They qualified for everything. So I think I, I don't know how to compare the Korean players to each other because I've only re really ever really seen DRX. Sure. Like, I haven't mm -hmm. really seen many of the other uh, players play. Um, so I'd be surprised if they could topple DRX. But at the same time, like, there's no doubt. Like, if they do the same thing DRX done, then, and like you said, like, I don't know who that Overwatch player is, but if there's some crap Overwatch player, like, he was the MVP of the second year. I think he was. was he? Yes. Yes. Yeah. He was like, well, here, but here's one thing again. Like, when we talk about sort of role clashes like sire did a lot of the opping for the guard understandably right? yeah but you surely you'd put carpe on the sniper that's like, the only downside he's a widow maker yeah the player. joke like, is they're both the same player in overwatch is the downside so we have to hope they're doing different style in Valorant. yeah yes. I agree. yeah i mean trx um, were all ex jet players essentially so it's like it depends what kind of cracked player you're talking yeah. about like Lurk is so cracked that i know that there was talks at some point where like there was some star player in Europe, jet player, that we could pick them up, and Durka could just play anything. Because, like, some players are just that good that, like, right. they'll learn. Some players are a bit more like, I'm only the jet player. Yes. I suck at everything else. So it just depends what kind of level of cerebral play they're able to actually do and what the coaching staff's able to kind of bring out of them, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess the thing, at least with, like, a Korean roster, is, like, they're going to have fewer qualms with role switching, I would assume, just because of, like, a, the work ethic sort of perspective. Um, like I assume, I assume that Sire and Carpe are both gonna. Sire and Carpe will both be duelist roles because then Ban will probably be Smoker, Munchkin will probably be Initiator, and Zeta will probably be Sentinel. But then, like, yeah, I don't know. I, I maybe they'll just double up everything. <laughs> I mean, you'd imagine a team like that, like they have that very strict conversation before they join. Like surely yeah, they don't get yeah, one of those players and they go, oh, by the way, mate, you're like playing like yes. the role that you don't want. So yeah, I think they would have, they hopefully would have figured it out and they're not just getting shafted that they've joined the team and well, no. I'm not the sniper anymore. Like, well, because also like Carpe and Sire know each other from mm -hmm. having played in the same league. Oh yeah. In a previous East, but, like them, them both being in the Overwatch League. Yeah, um, so... You know, they were opponents. They must be aware, um, yes, that they both play Yeah, they definitely role. Yes. know. Like, they definitely yes. know. <laughs> like, Zeta was obviously originally on that, um, was it C9 with Fan? He was with yeah, Fan. Yeah, he was on Cloud9, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that the rumor I'd heard was that, like, Zeta wanted to go join these Korean yep. players, basically. Like, he's yes. he's just, it's, it sounds like a friendship team to a degree, but they're all cracked too. So um, that's, like, I guess, a good, a good uh, sign, I guess. Sure. By the way, one thing I thought we could do as the last topic is, obviously, another key thing, I always bring this up on this show because a lot of the fans from my side are going to come from CSGO. I always say, the thing you have to remember in Valorant is they did the same ban system we do. You just ban the maps. You don't ban the agents. So that's what makes it unique. It's not like League where you just take out the OP shit. Hence why, spoiler, there will always be endless complaining about OP agents in Valorant. You can't ban them out. But the maps actually are way more important than people remember. So here's the question. They've obviously done this big map pool change. What do you think of this mini? Like, is this a good change? Are these maps you wanted to come out and in what do you think of the new map thoughts uh well we our second best map got removed so that was a bit annoying okay um and breeze was secretly one of our good maps that we just never played um, okay <laughs> so not the best map pool change for us um split and lotus like did you like split split yeah good map but the the the, the um 
notoriously entertaining to watch, even though kind of frustrating to play in ranked. Like, right. It's one of those maps that's a bit like Nuke back in like 1.6 or Source or whatever. Like, you just get 12 rounds of defense of CT, yes. and then no one has fun. So it's one of the most frustrating maps to play if people don't exactly, know. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So it was like that. Um, they made a few little changes that won't affect the ranked play, in my opinion, but definitely got implications in pro play. Um, so I'm, I'm all for it. Um, sometimes I try and like step back and just be like the outsider. Like as an outsider, like definitely 100. Like it was the map that had the most amount of entertaining games on. We were part of like some ridiculous like. 10 times overtime game that there was 0.02 like chronicle we beat and they keep they didn't defuse the spike by like 0.02 seconds and they would have gone to uh the event instead of us like it was all oh, right cool. um you know some some like lost some gray hairs came up from that game but um so yeah split's good uh lotus interesting like we it's really hard to say like when a new map comes out like it's so difficult it, it feels good um but I don't know. <laughs> it's really difficult to say. So we've just been practicing and kind of grinding a little bit. But... I will say, by the way, I do think that, like, it makes sense to talk about, like, a map coming back. Do you like it? A map going out. I do think the most wasted spinning the wheels discussions are before any pro games are played on a brand new map, trying to figure out if it's good or not. Because you know from CSGO, mate, like, I've just had this, in CSGO, we just got a new map called Anubis. I tried, like everyone else, I just rushed to play it on competitive. It, when I watched the first games in pro play, it was nothing like anything I'd play. Like, the joke was I just wasted my time you basically just wait until the pro the pros will figure out how to play the map so even if you think it's good you might be shit who knows yeah i mean i did some face it with like kia and like mighty max and they're both obviously pretty good at you know cs stuff and i was getting shot in the back every time so i was like exactly yeah. shit. you know exactly. i want to play inferno i don't fucking care you know what i mean so yeah um but the, I, the idea of changing two maps is i think i'm in fan fan of that like the idea that like they didn't just take away our binds. They also took away someone else's breeze. You know what I mean? So that's kind of a nice, like... By the way, I do like that move because one thing I think is a mistake in CSGO is that we only cycle one map out at a time. And the flaw with that, if you can't guess, it's an obvious one, casual fans, is if you just don't like the map or you don't want to practice it, you just make that your perma instantly and you don't have to... Pr you, can, you can sort of buy yourself three or six months more. Well, if you do two maps, you're going to have to play one of them. So you're going to have to... Everyone has to commit to grind again. You know? And also, obviously, it sucks in CSGO if accidentally the one map you remove, it turns out like the best team in the world, that was already their permit. And now, like, they get, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, if you get the one where it makes someone have the perfect map pool, is that can't happen if two new maps come. Like, everyone has to practice. You know? There's something exciting uh, about, like, seeing what they'll do with those maps. Because they're not just going to put, like, ow. They're not just going to put, like, Bind and Breeze back in untouched. Oh, they're going to rework them, right? Is that the logic? I assume like, so. It's the same in CSGO. Like, if you take a map out... I assume do something to you, change them. Yeah, you usually radically do something like change the bomb site or Doesn't the skin of the map doesn't even have to be anything huge. Like, the changes they did to Split weren't massive. Uh, I think the issue with Breeze was comp diversity was extremely small. Like, people think Icebox is, like, the, the least diverse map, but actually Breeze oh, is pretty much Icebox. the... Uh... So basically, our idea was, like, we it was kind of our promo band for a bit. And then we just made a cheese comp and just absolutely cheesed everyone at like mm -hmm. champions with it. Like Furio, we cheesed. Um, and I think that's maybe the difference between CSGO and this game is like you you can kind of do tricky things with your like weak map. You can do strategies that work differently. Like in CS, if you run some like XX strat, it doesn't work anymore. Everyone's too good at CS. And I'm like, <laughs> right, with this game, there's like so much util and stuff that even if you counter it, like you're still going to get stunned and flashed and all these kind of mollies and stuff. So. That's kind of like the interesting thing about the map cycle is your weak map can kind of become a map where you do some interesting stuff. By the way, I do love as well as an outsider that like I always forget every time I re-engage with Valorant, like what's oh, know on those games where you don't have the replays. So if the people don't know, this actually blew my mind in Overwatch They're when coming, I was first though. told this. Yeah, they are, but it's years Confirmed. later. Right? I remember the first time in Overwatch, someone explained to me not only that they collected all of the stats manually, like a human being had to actually pause every VOD and be like, kill to him, like but even worse if you were like scouting someone they said you would have to pull up the VOD and in the VOD so it couldn't be from the script in the VOD you were doing the same thing you were like pausing you were like looking at the radar like is that it was he right because you don't have the replay you can't just go behind him like we can in a demo like that that part is still wild about Valorant to me like that's because like that's, what what's off what's off one of the things I'm pretty sure I've said this before but like it, it's honestly one of the best things that Overwatch had was their their replay viewer I used to live in that thing um and I'm just like, you know what? Like, there are a lot of things that Blizzard hasn't done right. And that was one of the few things that they did do. And I would love it if everyone else could do it as yes. well. <laughs> uh, the, the only issue is, like, people like Angel or Boaster are already, like, 
kind of anti the replay system. Oh, really? Students, you know what I mean? I mean, I can so, see yeah. why, because if you're doing creative stuff, it's actually better yeah, not to like, replay. Yeah, kind of yeah. creative minds, right? Like, right. I'm not going to say I pretend I'm the creative mastermind. Like, Bose is actually, like, the creative sure. person on the team. So, like, when he creates something that's new, and it might take, like, yes. on, on the radar, it kind of shows up, but it might not be fully transparent right. what's going on. Like, it's kind of easy. Some, like, our Breeze cheesy strat stuff, like, Optic ripped that off and did it for the next game. So sometimes it's not that hard to do. Oh, right. Like, sometimes it's a bit harder. We're like, Bose just finds some lineup that there's one pixel and he needs to do a jump and, you know, ridiculous stuff. Like, like no one's ever going to find that unless they actually get the replay, you know, so... There is some hesitation towards that um, from the people that it doesn't benefit, you know? Oh, I can see why. Outside of point of view, like, yeah, yeah. Great, you know what I mean? Like, it, it makes sense. Meanwhile, the joke is, I'll give you the other extreme, which along the similar lines of how you're divided, like, if it benefits you, bad change. If it, if it doesn't, no, it good change. If it doesn't, bad <laughs> yeah. change, shouldn't it? The joke is in CSGO, we had the opposite example. I don't know if you remember this. It was about two years ago now. But when Valens, I can't remember if it was when he was with Cloud9 or when he was already with EG, but this guy who's like a coach figure, he basically did a mad tweet where he once just did a tweet where he said something mental like that everyone should be allowed to record the demos of the scrims because oh. like you know we're all just going to watch the VODs afterwards and get the game but the joke is that just sounds like you're just going like look instead of me having to do my homework we just have the answers like what like no, yeah. that's the whole thing of practice what are you talking about bro? that's the other end that was and by the way spoiler American so, you know, just saying, just I mean that's an interesting conversation we've had recently um because there is going to be I don't I don't know how much I'm allowed to say but there is more data access coming for, oh okay for Valorant so um, a conversation I've been having behind the scenes with like the data people for Fanatic and even like Patrick, I was like, what do you think about this? It's like, um, sc like scrim data and stuff, like how much is going to be available to the enemy team and stuff? Because obviously if we're going to scrim Na'Vi and they could just troll and then copy the stuff because they can see where we're dying and all that stuff. Sure. Like, um, so yeah, it's an interesting thing where in CS is a hard, like, it's a hard kind of like no thing. It's um, totally, essentially it's really bad etiquette if you do it and you, you will, the people will just leave the server. They'll, yeah. they'll say the other teams, you'll just get like sort of kicked out of the scrim group if you do it in CSGO. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's yeah, not like, like it's not like you can record the whole point of view. Right. It, it's going to be pretty reasonable, I think. So it'll be interesting. It's basically. Okay. Right, here's what I want you to do, just to end the episode, to make it fun. Let's just do some wild predictions. So all I want is this. All you have to do is pick this. And obviously, it is the beginning of the year. No, like, proper games are being played. So it could all be wrong, just like it is in every game. Just each year you give me, at the end of this year, 2023, right, we'll purposely say, for Minnie's sake, he's not allowed to pick Fnatic players here. <laughs> You have to pick the best team of the year and the best player of the year. So there you go. But you can't pick for that. Just, for, just so we're saying it makes it fair for you in that sense. So who are you going to pick? It's just a wild prediction because, again, it could be anyone this one, right? Who does your gut tell you? Uh, me? Uh, I'm not sure. Let me think. I think early, <laughs> early in the year is going to be like, like established teams I think are going to have. Oh, ah, okay. Um, so like your DRX, even like Leviathan, I think is kind of underrated. Like, oh, okay. Um, both teams that I think would do well. Um, end of year, I, I kind of want to say Navi because they're like the European brothers, but at sure. the same time, I'm like they're kind of our enemy. But um, maybe Navi and CNED's player of the year. Oh, CNED, that's a nice shout. That's a bit, of, hey. a little bit how well I failed on that one. Okay, he's bringing back the old vibes. Fair enough. So you take a deal. CNED's, CNED's always been good. No, but I mean the idea'd be the absolute best player of the year. Yeah, so that's yeah, pretty yeah. bold. Okay. I, mm, I'm inclined to say team of the, I mean, again, like, I feel like there's such a, a so be BM, I should just say to you, you can pick for that technically. I'm just saying. I, I can, yeah, I can. There, there's such a Western <laughs> right. bias here because like, I know less about the, you know, sure, like a course. lot of the, yes. the other teams. Yes. Um, because I agree that T1 could be amazing. Again, they're not an established team, so sure. they have that like going against them. But I, I think Navi are a good choice. The other team I would look at would be Hundred Thieves. Um, potentially, obviously, you don't really know what their ceiling is, but I think they they look like a really solid team at the moment. Um, what about player, player of then? the year? Oh. It could no, still just be, be fucking team. yay. It's like, yay again. We're back oh, to that. Okay. It, well, because well, it the be. thing is, yeah. is like, I would love to just go and be like, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be like fucking Forsaken from, from like PRX or something PRX, like yes. that. But I think even though the, there were players like that who got like hyper celebrated in 2022, 
because the team itself didn't like win they weren't necessarily in the conversation for player of the year even if they were really impressive players if that makes sense um so yeah i mean cned could be one but i think i could see yay still <laughs> still like being being up there um and then yeah someone like cryo or whatever from 100 these potential i mean it could end up being someone like nats i don't think player of the year is going to be someone we don't already know as a top player all right it will be a brand new person fair enough i don't yeah. think so by the way, what do you um, think on that mini? Like, is is Valorant already a game where, like, for example, like, yeah, it was like probably overall the best player last year, or if you look again, including performance and accomplishments, like, is it like CSGO in the sense that, like, you know, like, if Simple and Zemo and all them are the best last year, they're probably going to be the best this year too, like, unless something really drastic happens. Like, is there that consistency, you think, for players? I think we're still in the early stages, so I don't... It's like, I agree with Jiro that, like, it's not going to be someone we don't know, but mm -hmm. I would say that it's a bit different to CS that like Zywoo and Simple that's been you know every year yes. I've kind of tabbed into what CS is still Zywoo and Simple so <laughs> I don't think we're at that stage yet where it's going to be for the next you know and I think the kind of the, 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 the coach's answers like it depends on roles as well like right. obviously like you got Nico as the rifler so he always gets underrated yep. compared to like you know Absolutely. But, um, in, in this game it's like I'd say even with the with the um the yeah example it's like I think Chamber was built for yeah. So ah, like right. yeah, of course yeah. he's gonna pop off. But like it'll be interesting to see now he goes back to the original Judas role, like what does that mean for him? You know what I mean? Like I mm -hmm. pre nerf jet, I think like Durka was like just married to it, like it was just ridiculous. But like with this new jet, like I wonder who's gonna now be the best. Like obviously Dirk is still fucking amazing at jet, but like maybe there's a player who plays slightly differently that it just gels with it, more. Like you know clicks I mean? for them. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the thing, yeah. Gio, I've realised from this episode, fucking, I don't know if you know this, I can't remember who it was from the Bible, so I can't I remember if it was like the Apostle Paul or something, there's someone where they said basically like, the, like this is all things to all men, like, you know, to this person it's one thing to, the joke is that's what Durka is to Minnie here, it's just everything, he could just, he could, probably, he could probably be the idea, he could probably coach for that, he could probably just do everything, it's fucking it's just amazing, this guy. he's just amazing, isn't he? I mean, we played him Sky in an off-season event and he was not good okay. and he was not happy about that. <laughs> oh, I can't do anything then, fair enough, okay, we found his so, limit, okay. So yeah, no, it's just um, you know, I'm a big fan of Durka. Like I, I, I'm kind of like, you know, I've not been coaching too long. Like this is my first real esports gig. You ah, know what I mean? Like enough. this is like, to me, this is all new and fairy story, yes. like fairyland. You know, so I'm still living on a little bit of a cloud nine to a degree. No, By the way, to work with like an insane player is still kind of exciting. Oh, I will say one thing that is a fan will always misunderstand, especially when they like flame coaches who big up their own players. Is remember, you're seeing all the scrims. Like, if you actually have a really good player, they're doing like 10 times more in scrims than you see in the run rare official games. Like, every in theory, every coach of a truly great player should think his player is the best in the world. Like, you're just seeing that guy just own everyone all the time, you know? Yeah, like the most fun like I've had of the past few years is just watching him on stage, just like. You know, I just get to sit there and just watch him just do things to just you know, like. <laughs> so what are like, you and no, doing for Valentine's Day? <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, well, obviously the answer to you was Dirk is doing whatever, and Minnie's just. Oh, you're going to be in fucking Brazil, right? Yeah, he's just going to be spying <laughs> in through the curtains. All right, what are you up to? There? Yeah, I forgot it's Valentine's Day because obviously I'm a loser, so I don't. I forget about that stuff. But yeah, me and Dirk, I'm going to be watching his thoughts with him and kind of just you know. All right. Yeah. yeah no, but chill. obviously now our team's a bit more well-rounded, so it's like like I'll be honest, like Leo is. It is disgusting like when i'm watching him in scrims like i think that like the difference between cs and valorant right now is um there's a lot more discipline in cs like i think that's right. that mean the simple said that everyone in valorant's over peaking and i can't disagree like yes. well, most of my time <laughs> coaching is just telling people to stop peaking stuff all the time so um but for someone like leo it's like he's coming and i'm just like he's got that sense like he knows when he's by himself on the map he doesn't need to do anything like if someone's pushing him in a certain situation he's doing certain things that are right like He's waiting when he should be waiting, not peaking when he shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Leo's the fucking god of the hunter's fury. He's also very good, yeah. Uh, that, that, like, <laughs> very that, good at ulting. That man with his hunter's fury. Is well, we so used to, we had a player this year called Brave, and like obviously the Russian mm. situation happened, so you know. And he was so good at ulting that, like, Jake uh, Bosa said the other day to uh, Leo that, like, your ults are almost as good as Braves, which is obviously funny because <laughs> Leo is this, like, established player who's, okay. like, big. Yeah. And, like, yeah. Braves was just this kind of, like, rookie guy who came in. So it was kind of funny that, you know. That's so funny. Almost like an insult to him to be like, wait, what? Yeah, put you in your place. Like, yeah. don't get too cocky. <laughs> 
Now, I'm a baller, a visionary, and a hard worker, so you can imagine I'll always get by in eSports. But at the same time, I very much appreciate the people who support me, such as Matt Pugnacio Rakula, Ahmed Haju, Tosh, Bot Pounder 420, Animosity, Token, Tobias Berners-Gorny, Kovacevic, Jensen Go, and as always, special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest that will appear on my content? Do you want to ask a question in my monthly AMA? Maybe you want teasers, find out who the upcoming guests are for some reflections or interview content. Or do you want to be one of those nerds asking me questions, talking about the old days and new things and all those long, lengthy, topical discussions that I do? Well, if any of those tickle your fancy, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today, where? Via the Patreon link in the description box.